Amen. I appreciate that, young people. What a blessing. God has been good, hadn't he? And I don't have any sad tales to tell or any sad reports to give. I just thank God for his mercy and his grace. All right, with your Bible open, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And I want to begin reading with verse number 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. I pray the Lord's blessings upon the reading of his word. I realize that I need the help of the Holy Spirit this morning. I want to talk to you on this subject for just a moment. The return of Jesus. The return of Jesus. The return of Jesus Christ is the blessed hope of the Christian. The apostles of our Lord constantly and consistently reminded the early believers that Jesus is coming. They thought that the Lord would return in their lifetime, and he has not. But yet his closer is nearer than it's ever been before. Paul reminded the Thessalonians who had turned from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven. James said, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Peter talked about the trial of their faith in chapter number 1, and not only the trial of their faith, but it might appear as gold at the appearing of Jesus Christ. John the beloved apostle said and urged those to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Jude reminded his listeners of the prophecy of Enoch, in which he said the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. The book of the Revelation, five of the seven churches that he addresses in chapter 2 and 3, he reminds them of the imminent coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, the book of the Revelation closes with this promise, saying, surely... I come quickly. And so the apostles were consistent and constant in their message, reminding the believers of that early age that the Lord Jesus was soon to come. And then we find this if we look in church history. By the early church fathers, but the early church fathers neglected the message that Jesus was soon to return. They instead wrangled and argued about other theological questions. And in the next couple of centuries, the promise of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ fell silent. And the professing church become totally paganized by the 4th century. In the 5th century, the Dark Ages began. And during the next thousand years, biblical truth was almost silent. And it seemed like that the message of the second coming of Jesus Christ was silenced. In 1439, a man by the name of Johann Gutenberg came up with an invention called the printing press in which he printed the Bible and began to distribute it in people's native tongues and languages. Then in the 16th century, the Holy Spirit stirred up the heart of a man named Martin Luther and he began to preach the great Bible truth That a man is saved by grace through faith and plus nothing and minus nothing. And God used that man to bring about the Protestant Reformation and even Reformation within the Catholic Church as well at that time. But this great truth of the blessed hope would remain silent for 400 more years after Martin Luther. But around 1900, The midnight cry was clearly heard again. And the midnight cry was this, That behold the bridegroom cometh, 
Go ye out to meet him. Isn't it amazing that that great truth which was so neglected for 1,800 years in just the, basically the last 120 years has been the forefront message of the church. Our blessed hope has returned to us and the scripture is being expounded about this fact that the Lord Jesus is soon to come. And I'm glad, thank God for that. The great missionary movement that began in the late 1800s uh, had the message, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And listen, we have been privileged for the last 120 years to hear that great truth over and over and over. And I believe we're living at the hour of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you I'm not upset by world events that are happening today, but rather I'm kindly excited that Jesus is coming. And that is the hope that we have in this hour. Now just a few questions. Any subject you deal with, you need to ask a few questions. And uh, these are good ones. Simple and they apply to anything. Who, what, when, where, and why. And I want to answer them today about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is going to return? Well, the Bible said in John chapter 14 and verse number 3, Jesus said to his disciples, He said, If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It shouldn't surprise you, and this is not a deep truth, but the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is his return. And the scripture said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. You realize that when Jesus comes, he's not sending the chief angels. He's not sending the saints of Old Testament times or leaders of our day. But the Lord himself is going to return to catch away the church. It's Jesus that we're looking for in this hour. The Bible said in Acts chapter 1, verse number 11, as the disciples beheld the Lord Jesus as he ascended up into heaven, uh, those two angels that stood nearby, or those who were dressed in white, I suppose they were angels, he said this, Why stand ye here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus that you have seen go away shall in like manner come again. And boy, that's what I'm excited about. It is the return of none other than the Lord himself. So that's the who of his return. Then secondly, note the what of his return. What are we talking about when we talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I might all just spend a little bit of time here. Do you know we're living in a day when there are many people right here in the United States of America who have never heard the blessed truth that Jesus is coming again. What is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? I would explain it this way. The second coming of our Lord is in two parts. The first part is what we call the rapture of the church or the catching away of the church. The second part, which happens seven years later, is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back to the earth, we'll talk about those separately. First of all, the rapture of the church. That is the next thing on the calendar of God's events. There is nothing that has to happen before Jesus can come again. There are no scriptures left to be fulfilled. That was so in Paul's day. It is certainly so in our day. We have lived to see a great falling away by the professing church. But I want to tell you that the true church, those who are genuinely saved, have the blessed hope renewed in their soul that Jesus is coming again. And without further ado and without delay and nothing left to be fulfilled, we're waiting on the rapture or the catching away of the church. When he comes in the rapture, it'll be a secret coming. He's coming in the clouds, and we're going to be called out to where he is in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And that is exactly what the rapture is for. And at that time, only saints are going to see him and know of his coming. And then the second part of it, seven years later at the end of the tribulation, 
Christ Jesus is coming in what we call the revelation or the second advent of Christ. And this time he's not coming in the clouds, but he's coming to the earth. The Bible said that his feet's going to touch down upon the Mount of Olives. And the mountains are going to flow down at his feet. And that will begin the golden age of the rule and reign of Christ on this earth for a period of 1,000 years. He's coming at that time in power and great glory. Every eye is going to see him. And he will rule and reign for 1,000 glorious years. And so that's how the Lord Jesus is coming. His coming is in two parts. And then let's look at the when of his coming. You say, Brother Don, when is that going to happen? Well, I can assure you that no man knows the day or the hour of our Lord's return. And I'm not the only one, but I've looked and searched and dug in the Scripture to find if I could find one hit uh, in the Bible, one hint of what it will be like. Is there a certain event that will happen? And I've combed the Scriptures, and others have before me. Well, the fact of the matter is, no man knows the day or the hour. The Bible says that not even the angels of heaven knows. But I want to tell you, on God's calendar in heaven, there is a day marked clearly when the Lord Jesus shall return. And the Bible says here in our text, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, uh, you have no need that I write unto you. And certainly a season is not a definite time on the clock, uh, but we can get a general idea of what things will be like. For example, it's winter time now, and we know that. Just go outside. It's very evident uh, that we're living in winter time. If it's a snow and you can pretty well believe it, you're in the Christmas season or the, uh, I said Christmas, Christmas in cold weather, but winter season. Uh, springtime, you go out, the trees are blooming. Now, I might not be able to tell you that it's April 1st when that happens, uh, but we know that springtime is near. And the Bible says that we can understand the seasons. I think the season is right for the Lord's coming. So exactly the day or the hour, we do not know. But I'll tell you one thing that the Bible makes very clear. In Romans chapter 11 and verse number 25, the Bible says that until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. I think that that is a reference to the Gentile bride of Christ, which God's primarily doing in this age. He's calling out a Gentile bride for his name's sake. There's a certain number that's going to make up the bride of Christ. And when that number is fulfilled, then the Lord Jesus is going to come back to receive the bride unto himself. And so we find the fullness of the Gentiles when the last person gets saved that makes up the bride of Christ, then I believe the Lord Jesus will come and catch away that bride unto himself. But as far as a time on the calendar, a date and a time, I cannot name that, and nobody can. And, you know, a lot of folks have tried over the years and uh, put it in book form, uh, <laughs> only to be disappointed. And uh, we're not in the guessing game about that. The Scripture says that we are to occupy till He comes. That means that we're to work, we're to preach, we're to labor, we're to minister until He comes. And uh, that's what we're to do. That's the when of his coming. Now, where is he coming? When he appears in the clouds, will he appear over Jerusalem or New York City? <laughs> we want to think he's going to appear over Elkin, don't we, in Jonesville. That's what I'm interested in. And I'm not, I don't care about that crowd in New York or Jerusalem either, for that matter. <laughs> I'm worried about Jonesville, and I'm worried about Elkin. Well, I want to say this, when he comes, where is he coming to? When Jesus returns, the Bible says that he's coming in the sky. He's coming in the clouds, the atmosphere that is just above the earth. And I think when he's coming, if he comes and appears over Jonesville, I think they're going to know about it in New York. I think they're going to know about it in Jerusalem. It'll be a worldwide coming. I don't think he's going to have to encircle the earth like a satellite. But I believe when he comes, every eye is going to look up 
and we're going to see him whom we love. And that's going to be a life-changing moment. No matter what we're doing, in a moment, the Bible says, an atomos of time, smallest possible division of time, we're going to be changed and ushered into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming in the sky. Now remember in the rapture, he does not come back to the earth, but we're called out to meet him. In Matthew 25, the midnight cry is, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Listen to this. Go ye out to meet him. The first promise that Jesus made about his coming in John 14 in verse number 3. Uh, he said, I will come again and listen to this and receive you unto myself. Well, where is he? He's going to be coming in the clouds. And the scripture said that again in Acts chapter number 1. In the clouds, the Lord Jesus is coming. So I know where he's coming to. He's coming in the sky. And then I like this. He's coming with a shout as well the bible says the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god and you know what uh, you'll know his voice when you hear that shout you say brother don i'm hard of hearing you think i'll be able to hear him and i'm hard of hearing too if you don't believe it ask my wife Somehow or another, I can hear come. <laughs> I don't have any problem hearing. Supper's ready. <laughs> but Lord, I have trouble when it says, how about vacuuming the kitchen or sweeping out the kitchen? <laughs> I have trouble hearing those kind of things. But I'll tell you something. I don't care if you're deaf. You're going to hear a voice one day. There's not going to be any doubt in your mind who it is. Because he said, my sheep, they hear my voice and they know me. And one day he's going to come and he's going to come with a shout. And we're going to look up and we're going to be changed in a moment. And in the twinkling of an eye, he's coming with a shout. And he's coming in the sky. Sleeping saints are going to rise. Why that voice is going to be so loud that even the saints which are passed away and laying in their grave for many years, they're going to rise when they hear the voice of the Son of God. That's where he's coming. He's coming in the sky. And then why is he coming? I want to say, first of all, that he is coming to deliver us. He's coming to deliver those who have this blessed hope. He's coming for his children, the saints of God. For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many religionists in our world today who are tr trying to change the world that we live in. Did you know this Bible does not preach a universal salvation? It does not teach a universal acceptance of the gospel. There's a lot of folks that have the idea that the church is to preach the gospel and get people saved and good enough that the Lord Jesus will say, Boy, look down there what a good job they've done on earth. They've got all the world's problems straightened out and everybody's heard the gospel and everybody's got saved. I believe I'll just go down there and join them, put my kingdom up on the earth. Not going to happen like that. Bible does not teach a universal acceptance of our gospel. It teaches that this age will end in apostasy of the professing church and the rapture of the true church. There's a lot of folks trying to change the world that we live in. But I want to tell you, God never called us to change the world. He called us to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our job and our function as a church. And remember this, that we are the church, the ecclesia. We're called out. What God's doing by his gospel is calling out a group of people who will believe on Jesus and trust him as Savior. And that will never change this world or the world system. We're called out. And one of these days, when the bride is complete, he's going to call us out, even to this world, and deliver us from this present evil world that we live in. Religionists of our day, they want to change the world. They want to make it a better place. I want to tell you something. This world is not our home. We're citizens of heaven. And we're not looking to make this a better place. We're here to preach to people to get them ready to meet the Lord when he comes. I want to tell you what's going to happen to this world and this world system. 
after the true church is raptured out, God's going to send a strong delusion to people who nowadays reject the Lord Jesus Christ and this world is judgment bound. The world is not going to change. It is not going to have peace nor safety according to our text until the Lord Jesus comes to rule and to reign on this earth. And uh, boy, we're all time, we're, we're thinking, and I'll be honest with you, I think the church has made a mistake in this hour. Somehow or another, we thought Donald Trump was Jesus Christ. And we'll make a further mistake if we think that America is the church. It's not. Nations before us have lived and died and gone to judgment. And if this nation rejects God, it too will fade into the pages of history having rejected God and faced the same condemnation that nations before us have. But as a citizen of another world, as a stranger and a pilgrim in this world that we now live in, our hope is not here, our hope is in heaven from whence we expect our Lord and Savior to return at any moment. I don't know about you, but bless God, I get excited about that. Let her rip down here. Or let whatever happens is going to happen, and I can't change it. But I want to tell you what, look up, our redemption draws nigh. I believe that with all of our heart. He's coming to deliver us. That's why Jesus is coming. And think about this, not only to deliver us. I like this, but he is coming to delight himself. The Lord is coming to delight himself. You say, well, what are you talking about? He, the purpose of him going to the cross was what? So that we could be saved. Remember the first promise of his coming? He said this. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. I don't know all that motivated God to leave glory and come into this world to die at Calvary, to be buried and rose again the third day. I don't know all that motivated God. only thing I can say is love and compassion and mercy beyond degree. But I want to tell you what, He desires that you and I to be where He is. Now, if we are His bride, think about it like this. And I'm a longing for the Lord to come. I want to see Him. I really do. I've never seen him in my physical eye, but boy, I want to tell you something. I can't wait to get to that city to praise him and to bless his holy name for all that he's done for me. But when I think about how much I want to be there, even in a greater way, he wants us to be with him. He wants to be with us. I'll give you an illustration and I'm done. Marty and I, met not long after I got back in church and we started dating and we dated for about a year and uh, I don't know what happened I guess I got cold feet second thoughts I I don't know what happened but anyway after we'd been dating we talked about getting married was matter of fact I was already building a house and I thought boy that's where we're going to live and uh, so uh, I don't know what happened to me. You know how you fellas have a lapse of judgment every once in a while? I thought, Lord, help. It's a big commitment getting married. So I got cold feet, and we had talked about being married. But uh, on her birthday, uh, instead, everybody thought that I was going to give her a diamond for her birthday. But on, instead, I gave her a Bible for her birthday and broke up with her. <laughs> Lord, it was on. She cried and stuff. She should have shouted, but she didn't. She cried. We both learned a lot over the years. But uh, anyhow, we stayed broke up for a little while. Probably a couple, three months, we stayed broke up. And uh, so I thought about it that length of time, and uh, I decided. I talked to my mother about it. And I said, you know, I said, I'm going to ask Marty if she'll go back out with me again. And my mother said this. She said, well, now, listen, said, y'all have talked about getting married and stuff. And said, uh, if you're not going to marry her, said, don't go back out with her. She had talked to my mother, and she was heartbroken. And my mother come to her side rather than mine. <laughs> she always took her side in our fights. My mother said, don't, don't do it if you're not going to get married. Said, don't, don't go back out with her. So... Uh, at church, very timidly, I went up to her 
And I said, uh, you want to go, will you go out to eat lunch with me today? And uh, she said, no. I said, well, if I thought it was the Lord's will for us to get back together again, I said, uh, would you go out with me? She said, well, do you? <laughs> I said, yeah, I believe it's the Lord's will. So we went, and I bought her a nice steak dinner uh, that Sunday afternoon. We went out to the car. And I said, Marty, I said, uh, if I thought it was the Lord's will for us to get married, I said, would you marry me? She said, well, do you? <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. I believe that's the Lord's will. And uh, she said, all right. She said, uh, we'll get married. She said, when do you want to do it? I said, in two weeks. <laughs> she said, there ain't no way I can put together a church wedding in two weeks. She said, six weeks. I said, good, we'll do it in four weeks. <laughs> And so began my life of compromise right there. So you know what? Four weeks later, we had a church wedding and we got married. And I said that to say this. On the day, I mean, listen, I thought about it and thought about it. And we had been through all those things together. Uh, but I knew that that day was coming. And I looked forward to that day when she walked down the aisle and became my wife. I was looking forward to that. And boy, the day came that sure enough, we went out front there and we stood. And you know, they play that music. Da 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 da. Dum, dum, de dum. <laughs> when I heard that dumb part, I thought, dear God, they're playing my song right now. <laughs> so she marched in to dum, dum, de dum. Come down and got married. And I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't like that big crowd, and I was as nervous as I could be. You know what I wanted? I wanted that ceremony just to be over so we'd get out of there, go on our honeymoon, start our life together. That's what I was signing up for. Boy, listen, I wanted to see her, and boy, coming down the aisle. You know what I think is happening today? I think the bride of Christ is making herself ready. Through all the things that are happening to us today, I think we're being made ready for that glorious wedding day. And listen, if we want Him to come, think about how much more He wants to come. And He shall come without delay to catch His church away. I want to tell you something, folks. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And we ought to look up. Our redemption draws nigh. Our Father, as they come to sing, I pray that you'll bless this service. I have no way of knowing. I know many of our church members are listening. But I have no way of knowing who beyond that is listening. But Lord, you do. On this list in front of me, there's 22 states and there's foreign countries on this list of places where people are listening to this program and watching, I pray that you'll bless every one of them. Maybe in the far reaches of some country that we don't know of, that you would speak to somebody's heart. May they see this, have a desire to be ready when Jesus comes. Our Father, help them. And then, Lord, we ask you that as your people, that we might be willing to make ourselves clean and white, that we'd not be ashamed or embarrassed when you come. But, Lord, help us to be watching Help us to be working and waiting for your Son from heaven. We shall give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I come with nothing to offer you. In my hands no gift I bring. All I have my pride and my selfishness all I want is you as my king in my weakness now I come Lord be my strength and be my song in my need I seek your help Lord I am weak but you
Give me strength, dear Lord, to obey your word as I take the shield of faith. I receive your gift of salvation. I rejoice in the gift of your grace. In my weakness now I come, Lord, be my strength and be my song. In my need I seek your help, Lord, I am weak but you are strong. I am weak. There's no other way to tell you but to say God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams As I go to sleep each night Though I've had my share of hard times By my side he's always stood through it all, God's been good. Times are fading, I can see. I've cried some bitter tears, but I felt his arms around me as I faced my darkest fears. I've had more gains and losses. And I've no more joy than hurt As His grace rolls down upon me undeserved God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams As I go to sleep each night Though I've had my share of hard times by my side he's always stood through it all god's been good god has been my father my savior and my friend his love was my beginning and his love will be my end i could spend forever trying to tell you everything he is but the best way i can say it is this god's been good in my life i feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams as i go to sleep each night though i've had my share of hard times my side is always stood through it all. 